Southeast Missouri State University's president is responding to an online petition concerning how the school handles reports of sexual misconduct. In a letter to staff and students, Dr. Carlos Vargas says, quote, we hear you, we see you, and we believe you. Those are the same words posted in an online petition on change.org. The petition alleges the college is covering up sexual assault reports and has had more than 5,000 signatures. In his letter, Dr. Vargas writes, quote, let me be clear, sexual assault and related crimes and offenses are not and will never be covered up and tolerated at Southeast Missouri State University. Sexual assault and related crimes and offenses are not and will never be covered up and tolerated at Southeast Missouri State University. Sexual assault and related crimes and offenses are not and will never be covered up and tolerated at Southeast Missouri State University. He was a SEMO athlete, and it was last year. Um, I'm not really sure why I invited him into my room, but I did. And at first, everything was fine, you know? I had set some very clear boundaries at the beginning of this whole event, and uh, about partway through, he breaks those. And as a survivor of previous trauma, I quickly got very uncomfortable. We were hanging out and I was cool with hanging out or whatever. And then he kissed me and I was like, okay, but I don't want to do more than that. And then it just kept progressing. And there was one time I went to the bathroom to kind of get away from him. And then I came back and he was blocking my path and wouldn't let me move. And he kept doing little stuff like that to kind of exert his power over me, which was really freaking me out because I was like, I just want to get through which kind of made him get more violent uh, to the point where he was choking me and I could not breathe. Um, he ended up continuing like multiple times that night without asking me. There were just a couple times where I'd said no, where I was like, stop, things like that. And he just didn't really listen. And then I kind of realized which I said during my hearing too, I kind of just eventually knew that no matter how many times I said no, he was gonna do it anyway, because he kept grabbing me and putting his hands down my pants and things like that after I'd asked him to stop. So I grabbed a condom because I didn't wanna, I figured if I'm gonna get assaulted, it might as well be to the point where I'm not pregnant or ending up with an STD, so I grabbed it. And I know in my hearing, they kind of took that as consent because I grabbed a condom, but I would rather be protected than end up pregnant by someone that raped me. So I grabbed the condom and then he refused to use it anyway. I didn't realize until it was too late, but he tried to text me after and I wouldn't talk to him. Um, and I didn't say no. And that was a big part of the reason why I was like, I can't report this. You didn't say no. It was fine. You didn't say no. But like, I didn't say yes either. And I knew I wasn't cool, you know? We ended up breaking things off like weeks later <laughs> after he completely cut me off. And I just felt super used and unwanted.
Have you or someone on this campus experienced sexual violence? Yeah, uh, I know quite a few people that have experienced violence on our campus, and I am one of them. I am involved in Greek life here at CMO. Uh, I'm not going to say my chapter like out of respect for them. Um, but statistically, students who are involved in Greek organizations uh, experience sexual misconduct at a higher rate than um, other students. So I've definitely been exposed to that. I've definitely been in some like weird situations. Um, I feel like a lot of survivors, when they talk about sexual misconduct, they talk about like one specific event. Like, like this is like my sexual assault story. But um, in reality, and in, in my experience, there isn't just one bad encounter for your whole life. There are probably a bunch Did you ever feel safe on campus at all? Um, when I first came there, I did, but that was before I knew what was really going on. Like, even within my first couple of months at SEMO, I kind of heard a lot about other women being attacked and then nothing happening with it. So it kind of made me start to feel uneasy. And then there were things that I didn't bother to report it because I knew they wouldn't do anything, but there were times when like people would follow me to my room and stuff like that. And then when I did report it, nothing got done about it anyway. So it kind of just reaffirmed my belief that like, even if I do report it, nobody's gonna care. Nobody's gonna do anything. I had an experience with some other students on campus um, that made me very, nervous and scared for my safety and for my privacy. Um, I reached out to Simo DPS to help me through that incident and they informed me that unless it was happening on campus, they couldn't help me and that was the end of my phone call. Um, they just said, yeah, if it's not happening on campus, you can't prove this is happening while you were on campus, then uh, we can't help you. And that was the conversation I had with the dispatcher. I think that it's complicated. <laughs> Being a woman on SEMO campus is like a little sketchy, <laughs> like low key. Um, and I don't know why DPS and like a lot of the school administrators are like blue buttons, that's gonna fix it. That's gonna make everybody feel really safe. So my chapter um, was the first chapter to receive a presentation from DPS, which I assume was sanctioned by Southeast administration. Uh, it was probably one of the most like elementary, ignorant presentations on sexual and domestic violence that I have ever witnessed in my entire life. And several of the girls in my sorority like had to leave because they were so crying, like they were crying and like so upset. Um, and the DPS officer who gave that presentation uh, was just really insensitive to the subject matter and not at all helpful. My chapter was like so upset. We like, we stopped it in its tracks and no other chapter received that presentation. You are someone you know ever reported it or were they too scared to report you to friends? So um, I never reported personally. Um, and the two times that I experienced violence in my life, right? Neither time I actually reported it, which is kind of crazy. Cause like the first time I definitely thought I would um, if that ever happened again. And then I found myself in a situation where I was like, this is happening again. And the same stuff <laughs> from the first time just came back up. And I was like, you know, I'm scared. What about my reputation? You know. About all the people that don't believe me. Um, so we know that uh, specifically college age women are most at risk and we also know I think it's like 80 percent check my facts on my numbers if, but I feel like it's 80 percent of people who experience sexual misconduct experience it from someone they know. So a lot of times people say well, why didn't you report it? Well it's not because a psychopath pulled me out of the bushes and ruined my life it's because it was probably a friend or someone who I know I thought really well hurt me. 
and I don't necessarily want to see that person expelled or have their name in the headlines or whatever, so I don't report. So there are a lot of factors that go into that in addition to the rape culture in our society as a whole um, and the tendency to not believe survivors. It feels like my friends believed me more than anyone. Like, I didn't have to really interact with DPS, but I was really quiet about it for a while because I was so embarrassed. And then when I finally did, talk to the school about it, it felt like they didn't even really care that much, so it didn't make me want to tell people. Did anyone ever come for you, like, saying you're trying to ruin someone's life or you're trying to hurt people and, like, you're a liar? Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> How does that make you feel? Like, explain that. Well, obviously it doesn't feel nice because I wouldn't report it if I wasn't worried about the safety of other people. When I reported it, it wasn't because I wanted to be selfish and ruin someone else's life. I did it because I wanted to save other women from going through the same thing that I did. Yeah, I was a football player, of course. <laughs> and so the friends that were harassing me were his teammates and Actually, my ex-boyfriend played football on the team and he said they had a picture of me up in the locker room and they had my Twitter handle written down and they, the coach or someone pretty much told them like, stay away from this girl at all costs. And they were all making fun of me in the locker room before and after games and stuff. So when you think about like what you've experienced as far as sexual misconduct is already hard enough to process. But then if you want to report, you have to make a decision to be to lay it all on the table for whoever you talk to. It could be a stranger. Um, and then a lot of people will say, well, oh, well, John Doe wouldn't do that. He's a good guy. He plays football or he does this. He would never hurt anybody. And it's like, yeah, well, he did. So are you going to take him for his reputation as a good person and then totally ignore my trauma? Or are you gonna work with me and maybe John Doe can face some consequences for his actions? Do you feel like Seymour penalizes perpetrators or penalizes them properly? I mean, not enough. I, I've heard stories of a lot of people on campus and I don't know a single survivor in my life whose rapist is sitting in jail so I think especially when it's certain people it just gets swept under the rug because the guy literally said during the hearing they asked did she ever consent to doing anything with you and he said no she did not and they still didn't punish him instead I was asked things like well do you think he understood what no meant and I'm sorry but why is that my job to educate him on what two letters means. I feel like if you're in college, you're old enough to know what the word no means. If you refuse cross-questioning, then everything from the interrogation is null and void. So if they set that up to help survivors, and it ended up hurting survivors because the abuser could go through interrogation and flat out admit to misconduct and then during cross-questioning, they could just say, well, no, I don't want to be cross-questioned. And now all of the information that was gathered in the interrogation is not able to be used. He was in the hearing and he had the guy's back, so. I think his values are outdated, honestly. And if it was his daughter, I hope to God he would believe them, but I have little to no hope that he would protect his own daughters, if he has any.
Do you feel like Zero takes any preventative measures to stop misconduct and help survivors? I don't think they do enough, you know? Like, I understand that there's like a level of like, DPS can't do anything until a crime has happened, right? But where's the education, you know? Like, where is the, <laughs> Where's the education on consent? Where's the education on healthy relationships? Why aren't we teaching freshmen? Hell, why aren't we teaching high schoolers what it means to be in a healthy relationship and <laughs> what healthy sex looks like? Because a lot of people don't know. I remember the one little online thing that we had to do, but it was really simplified, like dumbed down, and you can easily just skip through it and click what they want you to say and be done with it. It doesn't really seem like it actually goes into anything important. And I think we really need to do refreshers and we need to do things more like that are gonna apply to our day-to-day -day lives, like tricky situations where it's not just a simple, like yes or no, like stuff that's gonna be more complicated because when you're in those complicated situations, you need to know what to do. Like in my case, the guy took off the condom too without me knowing about it. I think that's really important too, because people need to know that that's, if you're consenting to sex with a condom, you're not consenting to sex without a condom. So that's a form of assault. Well, all of our faculty and staff should be um, trauma certified educators and they aren't. Um, that's really important because if somebody comes to you, like it is vital that you know how to handle it right. Because it can be equally traumatic as a survivor just to go to someone and have them say the wrong thing. Um, and then on top of that, like we really need to educate the people going to our campus at a lot of universities, they're taking quizzes and tests every year to make sure that they understand consent. And we do it once. <laughs> it's just not enough. Everyone has this conversation all the time about, this is what consent is. This is not what consent is. And it's like, yes or no. Don't sleep with someone who's passed out. Like, I feel like that's basic. Like, yeah, no, you should not have sexual encounters with an unconscious person. Um, but, and I've spoken before in presentations that we've given through Red Hawks Rising about how two people can have a sexual encounter and person A might leave that encounter feeling really good. Like, yep, it was a good time. You know, that's what I wanted. So I feel good about that. Um, let's do it again sometime. And then person B, might be feeling like, oh my God, like, ew, I can't believe that happened. I didn't want that to happen. Um, because consent through fear or coercion is not consent. So when we say yes or no, consent is yes or no, uh, person A might think if they're like, give me consent, 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 give me consent. If there are 35 no's, you know, you need to stop at the first one and just stop and not continue to pester until you get a yes. Um, I think they should have an advocate or a counselor in there when someone's reporting all the time because you don't know what you're doing when you're sitting in there by yourself. Even if you have a friend with you, they don't know the proper procedure and what they should say and what's not okay to say to a survivor and things like that. So I think they need to have some sort of advocate in there to kind of stick up for these people whenever they come forward, because it's really hard and intimidating, especially with someone with that much power versus a student. There's just that power imbalance and you're sitting there like scared because you don't know if you're going to get in trouble for reporting it. 
most of the time it feels like we're punished instead of the person who actually did it. Like, I didn't feel safe at school anymore. People were always saying something to me. There was always something going on. So I just couldn't do it anymore. But he gets to live a happy life and go to school and do what he wants to do. And it'll never even show up again, resurface. Like, he'll never face any consequences for it. The Title IX has changed. Uh, the Trump administration changed a lot of the rules, uh, one of which was removing an, a, a survivor's advocate from any legal proceedings. Uh, so, like I said, it's hard enough to lay all of that on the table. It's humiliating. And now survivors are not allowed to have someone with them to just kind of like hold their hand and help them through it. Well, the current Title IX regulations are some bullshit, um, 100%. And those need to change. <laughs> like, And the school needs to be an advocate for those survivors and continue to advocate for those rights.